Well, first of all, welcome to the summer edition of B Festival 2021. Uh, my name is Acharte. I am part of the B Festival team. And I'm here to introduce you to uh, one of the talks that we are um, doing this year as part of the, of the program we are presenting. Um, the idea of uh, having those talks is to um, put together people to uh, have conversations or talk uh, and give different perspectives or share ideas about uh, some of the shows that we are uh, presenting uh, as part of the program. In this occasion, we are inviting Augusto Corrieri, um, artist, writer and researcher, uh, to uh, be part of a conversation um, with regards uh, to a show that we're going to have uh, in the program uh, from uh, Maria Jerez and Edurne Rubio, who are uh, both artists uh, that are based respectively in uh, Madrid and Brussels and uh, who have been involved in the, um, in the program, um, you know, a, a bit back uh, in time uh, as they were going to be part of the festival in 2020 uh, with a show called Anublo that they have been uh, working on uh, for some time. And uh, because of obvious reasons, uh, Anublo is not, yeah, it, it won't be possible for us to present it, but we are uh, working on a, a on other approaches to uh, to that work, uh, and in this case, it's going to be with um, from sunset uh, to sunrise uh, that will be presented uh, in the program on the 10th and the 9th of July. Um, so uh, the idea of this conversation and the starting point is uh, that sharing of some ideas uh, around the work they've been doing with regards with some of the work that Augusto uh, has also done. Um, this is a pre-recorded uh, session. Uh, and it will be available from the 9th of July uh, to see in the website of B Festival for those of you who are uh, following us now. Uh, so I think uh, that's it from my side. I will uh, give space to uh, Augusto, Durne and Maria uh, to start with uh, your conversation. And thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Charte. And hello, Augusto and Durne. Um, as uh, Acharte was saying, Edurne and me, we've been working on a piece for, for a theater called Anublo for a couple of years already. And during this process, uh, an artist, a friend of us, uh, sent us the, the text by Augusto uh, called The Rock, The Butterfly, The Moon and The Cloud, Notes on Dramaturgy and In an Ecological Age. And actually this text uh, for us, I mean, Anublo is a piece that is working with natural phenomena as, um, as also uh, dramaturgical um, events or phenomena itself. And we are doing an analogy between this natural phenomena and theater uh, phenomena. So when we read your text, Augusto, uh, we, we were very thrilled by the fact that your work was connecting a lot with what we were working on at that moment. It was really the very beginning of the piece and we were really writing and, and doing experiments in the, in the outdoors. Um, and I'm curious to know uh, where these texts come from. Um, yeah, what, what were you working in that moment? On? What is your interest on, on this, to write this text? Yeah, great. Um, I think that's a really good starting point. And I was really pleased, obviously, that, you know, that, that text um, had some kind of use or usefulness in your process. And I think especially actually because I remember when I, when I, I think it was 2017, that piece came out. Um, and I remember thinking what, what I'm writing here is, is a bit like impossible. It's like sort of proposing a kind of impossible dramaturgy or so I thought anyway at the time. Uh, I, I felt that I was, um, because of the age that we're in, which I, yeah, we might call an ecological age, we might call 
the Anthropocene or an age where everything's messed up. I don't know. Um, but so it, it feels to me that the art forms, uh, and I've mainly been based in theatre for 20 years, so that's my kind of field. But the art forms really need to kind of shift, not just shift their focus in terms of the subject matter, but also they need to shift their very structure and they need to shift um, how they even decide uh, what a focus is. It's almost like the whole apparatus of theatre and, and art or is kind of, um, I think, needs, needs to kind of not just adapt, but I think if you really sort of, if we take seriously the idea that we live in an ecological age, then I think so much of what we take for granted in theatre mm -hmm. is just is just very it's just very very different. Uh, some things maybe are no longer relevant, or they're relevant but in a very different way. Um, and I guess for me, yeah, that text was kind of trying to, and this is like what you know, so many other uh, well actual thinkers and philosophers are doing, which is like how do we make sort of uh, not just make room for non-human others, but how do we kind of, in a sense, acknowledge that um, the human species is just kind of one among millions of others. It's just kind of one form of intelligence. It's one form of, of a body. It's one temporality. It's one way of understanding and constructing space. And there are all these other temporalities, spatialities, bodies, um, all these other sort of non-human uh, lives and intelligences and phenomena. And so how can theater, I guess, shift? How does it need to shift in order to try and either accommodate these other, um, these non-human presences, or at least kind of gesture towards them in some way or find a way of acknowledging um, these other actors, shall we say. So yeah, so when I wrote the text, I kind of, I was a bit like, I don't know how theatre does this. I don't even know if it's possible. Maybe theatre, maybe theatre as we know it is not useful anymore. And that's fine, like in a sense, you know, if we're thinking speculatively, um, then if theatre is no longer fit for purpose, if it's not useful, then we can maybe let it go. But if so, then what other forms of performance? And, and yeah, I was using this word dramaturgy because it was in the context of a book on dramaturgy. Uh, and the editors actually were, were fantastic to help me to edit the text, by the way. It's always a collaboration. So it's not like my text. It was very much a sort of, yeah, a text that came, came about because of another conversation with the editors of the book. Um, so, so yeah, I guess anyway, um, that's, that was the, the genesis of, of the text. And so I was very kind of curious and maybe we can touch on that. Like, it seems to me that your project Anublo, which is translates as, as to the clouds, roughly. Um, maybe you can say a little bit about that, but um, I'm kind of curious because in a way it's like Anublo, your process, your research process perhaps is, is actually trying to do the impossible or, or trying to make possible some kind of impossible dramaturgy, this sort of, this, this kind of making room for, or making contact somehow with non-human natural phenomena mm. in the space of the theater, which is typically superhuman, human temporality, human scale, human space. Um, yeah, I don't know, I don't, maybe this is a, a good point to think a little bit, to, to tell us a little bit about the, the process, the research, the, the early ideas for a Nublo? Well, actually, uh, we've been working on how to, I mean, in, in our research, we, we've been working a lot with encountering the natural phenomena, like going to see the sunset, going to see the sun rays, uh, waiting for the storm, um, looking for the mist, uh, watching the stars, watching the clouds. And this, of course, um, have uh, changed also the perspective of how to look at the theater. Because we've, uh, not only in terms of expectation, because of course, when you are uh, going to encounter all these phenomena, you don't um, 
uh, necessarily uh, find what you are expecting. So already this idea of um, getting what you want or expecting something and actually uh, facing a completely different story because uh, the phenomena are not there for you, uh, they are there. So this is already something that changed our approach to theater. And, and for us, it, uh, I mean, the theater piece, Anublo, which is actually, yes, to the clouds, is a, is a, um, is a singing that people in the, in, in the history in Spain, in the north of Spain, is a singing that they were uh, singing to the to the clouds, so it was a re uh, uh, an approach to the storm, a direct approach to the storm, like really talking and singing to the clouds, saying, "If you are water, come, because you are welcome for our uh, fields and everything. But if you come with hail, with storm, with uh, ice, go away. We don't want you here." Yeah. So we were very interested also in this idea of. How do you approach natural phenomena from a perspective of, of an equal, like uh, an animism, uh, someone with whom you can talk? Uh, so um, in, the, in that sense, what position has uh, humanity taken in relation to this natural phenomena? Uh, um, a relation of domination, a relation of equality, and, and, and a relation of uh, religion. So in the theater piece, we are very much uh, taking the space of the of the theater as a phenomenon itself, as a landscape with its own temporality and with its own dramaturgy, uh, not uh, drive by human beings in the sense of the presence of humans, but how does the technology of the theater uh, create events as an ecosystem? Let's say so. Uh, so that was the point of, uh, of the part of the of the piece, uh, of the theater piece. Then, uh, then the process we have managed to do this theater piece, but uh, the process has been in, in the, really in the middle of the COVID. So it has also changed its form due to this uh, pandemic uh, situation as well. So. Yeah, so, so what we are doing, for example, in the festival now is a completely different story. But maybe Adorne, can, you can tell us a bit about it. Yeah. <clears throat> maybe it's good to know that uh, Maria and me, we don't have the habit to work together. I mean, we share our work for a long time now. We are friends and colleagues, but we are not uh, doing projects together, like a uh, sign together. Um, and this is the first one we, we, we do together. But um, both of us, we are very free on the, on the format. And both of us, we are always um, like questioning the protocols and the way uh, we share uh, work, art work with public, in which context, how, which position, temporality, all these things and always uh, questioning ourselves and we are questioning the, that. Then um, the process for us is super important and we are working the process in a very different ways. It's not only that we read things, uh, it's like we go out, uh, we have experience that can uh, um, give us some different point of view, some information, some ways to see the thing in another way. Uh, then already for Anublo, from the very beginning, we were uh, going to the countryside. We had a lot of experience in the countryside. Um, but the, the pandemic arrived. The first time after one year of writing dossiers and uh, writing papers and trying to get the money to do the work for theater, really a piece for theater, um, we had one week of uh, residency for first time in a theater with the machinery of the theater. Uh, we started on Monday and on Friday uh, lockdown. Then all, all our material stay in the theater um, <laughs> under the dust <laughs> for two or three months. Um, and then 
everything changed also for us uh, in the way of working. And um, it was very interesting for us, in fact, because we were talking about uh, uh, looking for a dramaturgy of non-human relation and an animism, and suddenly a little uh, uh, bee uh, that is not human changed the world, uh, changed every, all the temporality, all the relationship between uh, humans. Uh, the relationship with the space because we could not anymore travel, we could not anymore to be in a theater. Uh, we were enclosed in a house, in an apartment, um, only with our family. Then, of course, that, uh, uh, yeah, it was difficult for us, but at the same time, that bring us other way to see the, the same theme we were working on. Um, then it's funny because, for example, for the B Festival, it was supposed to have, uh, we were supposed to have one week of residency in a theater and then at the end show something in a theater. Point. <laughs> but uh, finally, we made a piece, then uh, B Festival proposed last year to do an online edition. Then we made a performance without being there, like, uh, in the absence, <laughs> the, uh, it was like a Zoom, like now uh, we were present in our houses, but we were uh, with the public without being with the public. Then that changed all the, all the meaning and all the thing. Um, and then, yeah, next year we will present uh, the piece in the theater. Mm. <laughs> next year is this year and we are still not able to go to England to present um, a piece in a theater. Then uh, we are proposing um, an activity outside of the theaters in, uh, to go uh, to look at the sunrise and the sunset with the public. Then all these things change a lot uh, the, the context and uh, for us, for the festival, for the public in Birmingham, uh, for the public. In and I, I, I was reading this text um, uh, that we read like uh, almost two years ago uh, from you. And I was thinking that it was a text before COVID. <laughs> and I, I was wondering what do you think about that? And if things change uh, for you uh, mm. and your, your way of thinking on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's nice to hear the sort of the, te the, the temporality or the kind of the journey for you in terms of like being in the theater for a week and then having to stop. Um, and it's interesting, of course, because, yeah, if you're thinking about um, you, in, in a sense, exploring the theater in a, in a slightly different way, because this is a project about, yeah, sort of looking at how within the sort of the box of the theater, we can perhaps witness non-human events, or we can have a suggestion of natural phenomena or the theater as a kind of natural phenomena. Maybe, we'll, I mean, we'll talk more about this, I guess. But um, so of course with COVID, that, uh, if you like, aesthetic philosophizing suddenly became very, very real because overnight thousands of theaters around the world had to stop. And a lot of theatres, um, like like you said, had this situation of, uh, you know, for example, sets on stage remaining on stage for months. So a very strange kind of suspension. Um, I remember Virginia Woolf writing about this kind of empty house in, in a really beautiful passage, I think, from To the Lighthouse and sort of describing the curtains in the house and the, the table and the dust. And so all this kind of animation of what we normally consider to be the background, um, uh, it suddenly became like, becomes really real. But I guess before COVID, that was maybe like a bit of magical thinking, like, oh, you know, the, the curtains are alive a little bit, you know, and it's just something that a few philosophers are interested in. And all of a sudden, that's the reality that we're all in, uh, like, except that we're not at the theater. So in our minds, I mean, it's always been a really interesting experiment, I think, even as a child, to imagine a room that you're not in. It's mm. such a sort of odd thing. Like if you now imagine a room that maybe you know well from your past or, you know, and you imagine 
what, what's happening? You know, what's like, what is it like now in that space? You know, what's what's taking place even on a micro level, uh, you know, dust forming um, or whatever. So, you know, like uh, I, I work at university and so I didn't go to my office for six months, I think. And then I, you know, after six months, I opened the door and I was like, whoa, you know, and it's kind of slightly modified. Like stuff has been happening. You, you know, there's, I mean, nothing really like major, there's no major, event but so anyway i guess what covid forced on everyone was like in a way the reality of this way of thinking the reality of kind of uh phenomena that are a little bit outside of of you um maria earlier said like you know the phenomena are not there for you and i i, I really like that idea that sort of like that idea that i guess that we are part of a bigger world that is not necessarily uh, of our making or, or that's not there for us, you know, there are just things that are happening all the time. And so it's kind of amazing that all of a sudden we all retreated to our, to our homes, if, you know, if, if we had a home, if we kind of have that security. And then all these other spaces are just kind of existing in what we might think of as in, in limbo or, but actually, yeah, these, these spaces were all of a sudden, of course, you know, there's stuff going on there. And, and so that became really, that sort of philosophical experiment became one of the dominant realities of the last year and a half, which is really mm -hmm. interesting. I guess I'm, I'm, I'd be curious if like, because I assume that when COVID hit, you were still, uh, I mean, you're still very much in your process. So I'd be curious if you had, uh, yeah, thoughts around COVID, if it, if it, for example, influenced your thinking about Anublo, or if it was just a bit of an annoying interruption in, in you know from the point of view of the project obviously I'm not talking about personal life and all, all of that but from the point of view of the project did Covid in a way prove something inform you know inform your piece or was it simply <clears throat> a pause you know um I think I think it changed um it changed quite a lot something that was already there. I mean, in, in a way, as you said, like uh, it was already there that we wanted to work with the outside and the inside. We wanted to work already with the idea of the theater as an enclosed space uh, made by human for humans. Um, and at the same time, we were working with the idea of getting away from watching at the theater as a landscape and uh, invoking other kind of landscapes. So you watch the light of the theater and then you think of the sun, but you are watching the light of the theater. So there is always this duality or in between the inside and the outside. And I think COVID um, was, uh, and, and how, for example, you can touch the sun without uh, or the idea of the sun of the sun without being touched by the sun. So this idea of being um, together with something that is not next to you or that is not uh, in contact in direct contact with you, I think COVID has um, expanded this idea very much of uh, how to, as Donna Haraway says, like how can you create intimacy without. Uh, um, without pro proximity, mm -hmm. for instance. And I think this, this has uh, highlighted something that was already in the project, but that uh, but we were not so aware. Now it's like really like uh, very much, as you say, like now this is a reality that we are all in and, and how, yeah, and this has affected the reading of the piece, I think, as well. Uh, but the awareness of uh, of what we ha we were handling as well mm -hmm. uh, in the in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, in fact, it helped us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, COVID. Thank you, COVID. Uh, we had the ideas. Uh, more clear ideas about what we we were working with in our mm -hmm. hands it was more clear yeah 
that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It has been very painful as well because we we were the one the thing that we one of the things that we wanted to work on the piece and we and we are still very interested in is the presence of the audience and we didn't have that for two years so that was really painful because one of in, in, looking at the theater as, a, and as an ecosystem the the audience is part of that ecosystem. If it's not there, it's, it's also lacking uh, diversity, <laughs> let's say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this was at the same time painful, but we've been really, yeah, using it somehow mm-hmm. through the process. Yeah, I was wondering also, reading yesterday your text is like, uh, we are uh, how to do a, um, a dramaturgy for non-human, uh, but this, um, how, which kind of public we will have, or or, or to <laughs> also this idea of public that doesn't exist anymore, or or has has been um, problematic during these two years, like working for 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 whom for. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. Yeah, yeah. That is interesting also in the sense of uh, who who's the audience or what is the audience, not only thinking that maybe this idea of what is the perspective uh, in terms of human, non-human, uh, what suddenly is watching us, like maybe it's not only humans, is uh, is something else. Yeah, and that is also interesting for us, uh, this idea for example, when we are proposing to the public to share the moment of sunrise and sunset, it's like this is a dramaturgy, a piece that is not made for us. It's, we are there a little bit like squatters or like a, <laughs> a profile, uh, how do you say in English? Like, mm-hmm. a, where, uh, like something is there, it's not for us, but we are here and we decide that it's for us <laughs> mm-hmm. in a way. And yeah, all, all this relation in between um, what you are seeing and who are you and when you are there and it's very interesting for us. Yeah, yeah maybe I have a question around that, I guess is, is um, so yeah, so you've been organizing these um, <laughs> sunrises and sunsets. <laughs> Uh, is that that sounds like you've made them happen? I don't mean that obviously, but you've been kind of framing framing the encounter with the with the sunset mm-hmm. or sunrise. Um, and I'm really curious, I guess, about so sort of thinking a little bit about the theatre on the one hand and then natural phenomena. And for a moment, I'm going to sort of think of them as separate, even though maybe what what your project is doing is actually proposing that the theatre is always already. Uh, an ecosystem, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, a place for natural phenomena. So, but for a moment, if we think of them as separate, and I guess I'm sort of thinking of how natural phenomena, like such as a sunrise, have a certain kind of, yeah, dramaturgy, like in the case of the sun, it's very, um, it's very powerful. It's very clear, like it's the beginning and then the middle, like literally midday is the middle, isn't it, of the story. And then sunset is the end and it's death or, you know, black or it's, you know. So that's like a really clear narrative. But then there are other sort of forms of dramaturgy or other kind of rhythms, other ways of experiencing time, including time temporalities that we don't have access to, of course. We can imagine that the hill has, a, <clears throat> has its own cycles, has its own clock, uh, and it has its own sort of lots of little micro events. Um, or if we think of the ground and beneath the ground, you know, the sort of the, the mycelium that grows underground, you know, the fungal networks, there's so much happening that we simply don't have access to. And so I'm kind of curious, I guess, about whether in your project you were, you know, whether these experiences in nature, how you're able to sort of, or if it, if this is right, even you know, if, how you're able to kind of take them or take something from them, 
take their essential shape or take uh, something about their the event of say a sunrise or a, a micro phenomenon and and sort of put it inside the theater like both the big events the, the, the really clear dramaturgy sunrise and sunset you know as well as these kind of like it's really hard to sort of name now but these kind of like sort of phenomena that perhaps uh, fall just below the threshold of perception you know or or maybe like like you say you're you know you're in a field nothing's happening mm -hmm. so do you kind of go oh it'd be it'll be good to have you know 10 minutes in the show where nothing happens you know I, I guess i'm kind of curious about that because of course in the theater we have very particular expectations about what you know what show it is you know so i'm just kind of curious i guess about the way that I guess one way of saying it is that the outside comes inside. But again, I'm sort of assuming that there are two discrete things and spaces, and that's maybe not not right. Um, but it's that kind of a movement, you know, opening up the theatre to to something else, to something bigger, to something that typically we don't think of as existing inside the theatre, because it's a space for human stories, it's a space for drama, it's a space for humans watching other humans you know whether it's telling a story or executing some kind of action that we understand that we recognize ourselves in so yes i'm very and this is i guess something i've worked on a little bit more theoretically like what happens then to the theater when we open up to the rain when we open up to anonymous events when we open up to non-human temporalities mm -hmm. what does the theater need to does it, is it does it signal the destruction of the theater the end of the theatre, or is it something else? Sorry, there's a very big question. I realise, but <laughs> but I guess this is also what your what your what the project is exploring. I think it's one of the main interests, and and also uh, it's a lot about how can we learn from our relation to nature about our relation to a spectatorship and theater as well. Like a little bit, as you were saying before, like how <coughs> all these ecological relations can also change the way we, we make uh, artwork and we relate to artwork as well. So for us, for example, one of the things that uh, is very important as a com is theater, we're also um, interested in the idea of, of the theater as um, um, how we can break the idea of a modern theater that is frontal, that has something in front of me that is the object that is there for me and that I can uh, understand or be thrilled by or, or be fascinated or be surprised or so how how can we get rid of that and think about the theater already as a multi-directional space so things are not only happening in front of me through um, the so taking taking a bit of power to, to to the view to the eyes and what are the other what are the other sensorial and sensual um aspects of, of that building. That was one of the most uh, difficult things because the conventions and the space is such a powerful apparatus and made for actually uh, what we are trying to get rid of and how can the information already come from a multi-directional uh, way and how can we work with micro details and uh, macro uh, events? So we try to, as, as, as it will happen there in the valley, uh, have a wind from behind, have a drop, a very little drop in your, in your arm, uh, have um, the sound of something that you don't know what it is because we one thing that we also realize in the process is like nature is about what you can recognize but it's a lot about what you cannot grasp or what you cannot recognize and that is also part of the feeling when you are out outside in the forest in the night is you cannot recognize 
what you are experiencing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we try to put that experience in the theater as well. So it's not only about representing something that is not here, but is uh, mm, creating um, a state of being in an uncertain place. So how to, be, how to bring that, that uncertainty to the theater? Mm -hmm. You wanted to say something? Yes, it's also representing something that we don't know, that we, we mm -hmm. know, like uh, really we don't know. And that I think we, we learn quite a lot about this relation with nature. I think uh, most of us, probably not everybody, but most of us, we have uh, an image, uh, a created image of what nature is. Even, even something as a sunrise, as a sunset, you you say about that, but and you have an image, but this image is most of the times are just in the other way. Like not always you can see the sun. Some sometimes it's cloudy. Then you can go to see the sunset, and you will not have a postal car um, uh, sunset. And even the temporality is very different than what we think it is. For example, the sunrise. Uh, first time we go to see a sunrise, you go just to see, to check in your phone. Okay, it's at uh, 7 30, 13. And then you go five minutes before. But if you arrive five minutes before to see the sunrise, you don't see the sunrise because the sun, the light of the sun is there one hour before. Then you will miss the sunrise because the sunrise is also the light, not only the circle of the sun. Mm -hmm. Then this kind of relation with nature also is very simple. We 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 are in a very simple way connected with with the the represent uh, the representation of the nature. Then in the theater we also try to represent it something that is more unknown, more um, strange, and the times and the the, the dramaturgy is not so. Uh, yeah, and suddenly, for example, the sunrise, suddenly the sun is there and you were waiting for one hour and then it's two minutes, it's not more. And then there, there is also not a naked, uh, it's not a theatrical dramaturgy that you imagine. It's like everybody imagine a very slow sunrise it's like this. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we try to work also on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think... Um... The temporality of the piece is a strange temporality. Um, it's it's not. Uh, I mean, we are also working with things that are not un under our control. Like uh, we work with the smoke, we work with temperature, we work with um, uh, smell, we work with um, touching, and and sometimes we put it there, but how it reacts, what is actually happening, it's not under our control. And it, it, it's, it's a timing that is between, it's a theater, but actually it's not a um, theatrical time. It's not really like, a, um, yeah, it's not, we cannot control how yeah. certain things are gonna react in the room in that very moment. And, um, that that is a bit disappointing sometimes, uh, like in terms of expectations. And as Edurne was saying, you go to see the sunset and it's super cloudy, and and we know it's a fragility of the piece because it leaves uh, the 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 audience in an in an uncertain uh, position, like what, what what is really going on. Uh, but we are interested as well on that and not on not controlling and putting there the problem of uh, uh, why are we so um, interested in the things to work or to be or to be um, as we want them to be. And this for me is also related to, with the idea of nature in terms of modernity, for example, like how we've been trying to dominate or how we've been trying to um, control through technology uh, or, or yeah, or, or this idea of uh, what is the difference between weather and, and 
en Spanish we would say el tiempo and el climate, el clima, the climate and the weather. And the climate is something that is the average and you can expect to go to the beach in Malaga um, in August and expect that it's going to be super sunny and blah, blah, blah. And then you have the worst <laughs> rainy week in the summer. Uh, so it's a little bit the, the difference between climate and weather, what mm -hmm. you're actually... And, and this, we like to experience that also fragility of the human being in front of this phenomena that is like, yeah, sorry, uh, it didn't happen. <laughs> or it happened in, other, in another way, which is also the way I think it's interesting to think about uh, nature is that it's not there for you. Mm. But then maybe you have to change the perspective of what does it mean that uh, is not happening what I was supposed to, to experience. Yeah. And, and that in terms of spectatorship, I think is super challenging as well. And as makers, like this is, uh, I think what is interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, great. I, I guess where, where my mind is going is a couple of places. Uh, one is, um, I mean, I'm just trying to articulate this now for the first time, I guess, so it might not work, but I'm thinking of what you're saying about, you know, control and, um, on a micro level, when we go to the theatre or when we are engaged in a theatre making process, yeah, traditionally, typically, uh, we want to control what happens in order to produce certain effects. Um, and those need to be able to be reproduced show after show after show. So, you know, it's very much a kind of, yeah, a question of having an intention, knowing how you can um, work with that intention to produce something that fits uh, and that you have control over and then you sign it you know so it's very much this kind of yeah like we are the agents of what happens you know mm -hmm. we take responsibility for everything and then people go to see the show and you did something great you know it's very very clear who the agents are of what happens and what you're working with here it seems to me anyway and I guess there is a history of of art that kind of connects to this and maybe this is what I want to try and get at but it's more this idea of like actually the agency is in a way it's not just human agency it is down mm. to what you look to the weather and not just the climate it is down to what happens to happen which mm. is not to say like oh nothing to do with us of course you are the ones to some extent curating and framing the experience in the event and you take responsibility and your names are on the event but you are nevertheless conceiving a type of performance which gives room to yeah these other kind of spaces and qualities which you we cannot invest with intention or desire you know or or we can but then we'll get frustrated mm -hmm. you know inevitably because it's like well something isn't happening quickly enough according to my desires well what if you just attend to an event that doesn't fit your desires i think that's really Interesting, but I guess the thing I wanted to say was how the question of control is, I'm a bit worried because um, COVID was this kind of, to go back to COVID for one second, is this explosion of a lack of control. But now, of course, in order to deal with the health crisis, the, the fact that you know people are getting ill and dying from it, uh, it seems the only way we know how to deal with that is, uh, you know, is by exercising crazy amounts of control uh, on, on, on each other and our lives, on the spaces we inhabit, uh, you know, so that, so it's a very, uh, we're in a sort of very, very delicate phase, I guess, where um, the risk is that, you know, the sort of opening up uh, that happened gets kind of shut down and, and, you know, everything becomes very, very super policed. I guess is what I'm is one of the sort of the, the negative sides of, of COVID. So um, yeah, it's important I think to sort of keep finding ways to open up space. And and I guess on on that, I'm thinking a little bit then of the histories of art and theater and performance that maybe we kind of build on. And I always think, for example, back to John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds, because historically it's one of those first moments where, you know, for that duration of time, 
the audience was basically asked to just listen to the sounds in the room. And also that means the sounds coming from outside. So it's exactly what we're talking about, I think anyway, this sense of like um, uh, engaging with things that are outside of our control, outside of the artist's control, but still the artist is providing a framework for engagement. Uh, so that's that's like super interesting. And, and still four minutes and 33 seconds when it gets presented, you know, there's still this kind of like, oh yeah, the, the joke music piece. There's still a sort of sense in which it's not real music or it's not real art. It's like a prank, you know? So mm -hmm. I think it's, and I think it's, it's a useful to notice that because it, there's still a real aversion from a lot of, of, of us in uh, accepting this way of understanding art and performance. You know, what does it mean to just offer four minutes and 33 of, of silence? So it's kind of like a, a way of retuning our ears. You know, it's mm -hmm. a way of kind of like accepting that, yeah, all and any sounds happening in the environment are, you can attend to it as music. Anyway, that's a 1950s John Cage idea, but I'm kind of, I'm aware of like people like Robert Wilson or more recently Heiner Goebbels are, you know, thinking of the theatre in a very different way, in a sense approaching it maybe from a visual art perspective uh, as opposed to a dramatic perspective. I'm kind of, I guess I'm curious then about in, in Anubla how it's been for you. And I know you have like, or maybe Adorna, you're more of a, a visual artist, performance maker. And, but I'm kind of curious what, what it was like to approach the theatre perhaps a little bit as a, yeah, as, as visual artists or with visual arts methodologies perhaps or, um, or visual art processes. If that's relevant, it might not be super relevant, I don't know. Well, I, two things. One, I uh, normally uh, from my work for a long time now, I'm working quite a lot on site specific then each time I do works in relation with a place. Mm. And the two pieces that I made for only for theater uh, are talking about theater and about the, the building of the theater because I was working a lot about the space. Uh, it's like my theme for the last 20 years. I, I working about the relation uh, of human about uh, with the spaces that we inhabit. Then this is another space, the theater, and I really uh, look at the theater as a inhabited uh, space and yeah. And uh, what was what I wanted to uh, another thing is like I I never I I mean it's true that I study sculpture in the in the in the fine arts uh, university, but I never recognize me myself like a like a sculpture or like a visual artist. It's, it, it's true that is my background, but when I start a work, I don't know what will be. It can be an audio, an audio piece, it can be a performance, it can be a, then for me it's not a very, I'm not busy with this, with this idea, I, I, it's not a strange to, to me to suddenly start to work in a theater, okay, it's a theater, but it's like a, another kind of a space, I, I work it yeah. quite a lot in the spaces that were uh, other things like uh, fabrics or like uh, schools or like uh, in the streets or and this is a theater. Yeah. yeah more yeah. or less. <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm interested in what you said um, Augusto about the the like what how um an an uncertain um situation as COVID um leads us to over control everything and I think the the problem and I and I also related with Anublo and what Edurne is saying as well is um what for you can I mean like if you want to keep the world as we know it if you want to keep the rules as we as we uh, experienced it before then of course you need that control because it's exactly that way of living 
uh, that uh, is impo is uncom uh, uh, incompatible. That it's not um, uh, it can it cannot coexist because it has to do with contact. It has to do with uh, social um, exchange, with uh, traveling, with uh, so. But if you want to keep that, then you need to control it because it's the way that the virus has to expand. But what if you think about life in another way? What if you say like, okay, I give like, for example, the government saying like, uh, uh, in order for you to live another life that is more suitable for this situation, then we are going to arrange this, but we'll change our life completely, let's say. No? So in terms of what you were saying of the theater piece and the visual arts, I, I understand very well this problematic because I come from theater, but there are so many things that I don't like from theater and choreography and what we've been understanding about that, that I'm, I need to get very far of the, those rules <laughs> in order to understand the uncertainty that I like mm -hmm. about theater and art. So um, in, in this piece, I think there is something about that is like, how can knowing that is not a, a theater timing or knowing that is not a, um, a temporality that uh, has to do with uh, dramatic or choreography as we know it in the idea of controlling what is happening. And then you go far from what a theater experience is. And this is what an artist uh, told Ledurne after watching the piece in, in Brussels is like, what I like about the piece is that it's not, it has no a theatrical timing. And, and that I think is what is interesting uh, very much for me. There is yeah. something also that um, uh, it, it was a little bit uh, hard to work on this project in theaters because the theaters and I think the world in general are very um, aseptic, you say, aseptic and security. Aseptic is like not uh, illness, not everything is clean, everything. Right, yeah. I, I don't know what is the word in, in English. That is like, uh, we try to have a very clean world out of illness, um, out of uh, virus, uh, out of batteries and also security like uh, for us it was a big problem the security <laughs> in in you in theater if, for setting up the piece yeah like, for, for the... creating the piece we were always like i oh, know this is not possible uh that yeah. thing it would be very difficult to do in certain theaters yeah um then we we were always like uh, pushing the, the limits or the borders of what is uh, possible to do now yeah. And I think we, we were very interested in, in this idea of the theater before uh, Renaissance, when it was uh, in, a, in an open space, the theaters like in Rex or Elizabeth theaters, there were rain inside, there were people, there were birds inside. And even then, do you remember, Maria, this guy we met uh, that was studying uh, old theater, like, like old machinery about theater, and he was telling that before, for the light, for light in the, the theater, they were using candles. And then they ca there were so much candles uh, in the theater that it was a smoke. And then there were people that feeling not good. And, yeah, and then people were thinking it was the emotion and the feeling, but in fact is that it was <laughs> super smoky. And, <laughs> And this, this alive wall uh, that is not anymore in the theater was for us um, like difficult to, or we tried to find like things uh, open, uh, doors that are open that would never be open during a, a performance, lights that are there and are never used for the performance that we use. And we were looking for all these borders in, in between what what is there yeah and, and and what can we get a theater alive and a life space and not a dead space that could bring the life inside 
yeah. for one hour and the rest is... <laughs> yeah. It's very close to a lot of the stuff around COVID because yeah, I think especially in the UK, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like in Spain or Belgium, and I always have the impression, but maybe I'm sort of projecting, I always have the impression that in the UK, where I live, health and safety comes before anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like before life, <laughs> we need health and, you know, before anything, the most important thing is ensuring health and safety. And of course it comes a bit from America, from the US, because if your workplace is unsafe and someone trips there and they get injured, uh, the problem is that they could sue you. So it's mm -hmm. a financial, you know, it's a financial thing as well. It's like capital, it's the laws of capital descending onto not just space, but what can happen in space and how we need to plan and predict, make everything super predictable and safe. Um, and, and, you know, and so, so the, the fi financial capital is kind of, has found a way in a sense of, of, of infiltrating uh, chance and the laws of probability and, and yeah, time and space in a really, it's like in a really amazing way. Um, but, but again, it makes me think about COVID because, um, wh why is that, I guess? Yeah, because often I've struggled with health and safety in the UK in terms of presenting performances. And it's like, because that comes, you know, before anything else, you know, the, the, the health and safety has to come, that sort of element of control is, is the most important thing, you know? So then performances has to kind of find a way around it. And now I can't remember what, I was gonna try and make a link to COVID, uh, it'll come to me, but sort of, because I don't want to sound like a, you know, anti-lockdown or anything like that. I'm, I'm deeply pro-lockdown. I'm deeply pro-lockdown, but there's just something about, yeah, oh, it'll come to me anyway, yeah. But I have another link to yeah. what, what you're saying, which is, um, we, we've worked with a, with a fantastic, uh, technician uh, who has a lot of experience, who comes from an old school and he's um, a machinist. He works with the, with the machinery and doing effects of dropping uh, curtains and, and stuff like that. And he was saying like, uh, he, he experienced the transformation of the rules in the theater mm -hmm. and how before there was, he was saying like, the French way of looking at theater and then there was like the uh, English and German way of looking at theater and what the English and, and, and uh, German way is about uh, security and safety and looking for the responsible the responsible so when you look for the responsible everything gets very strict because there is always something someone who is guilty while in the French way, there is the accident. There is the possibility that it's a fucking accident and it's okay. I mean, it's, 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 we are very sorry that this happened, but there is a chance that something unexpected happened. Mm -hmm. And then he was like uh, talking about this. Uh, I found it super interesting. But there is, I mean, I, I am, we, we had this horrible um, experience in Madrid when the premiere was canceled in the very last moment. And it's because nobody wants to be responsible of the COVID being spread out during the piece through the ventilators, let's say. Um, and there is a morality as well behind all that, which is very suffocating because of course, when you suddenly you are the one, <laughs> the one who's guilty, then it's like, oh, I don't want to be guilty. Mm -hmm. um, and this makes me think of Anthropocene because mm -hmm. the Anthropocene is the, this idea that we are force, that we are changing. Um, but again, there is, it's for me, it's very, um, I have a conflict with that as well because I realize that we are, we are a force, we are changing the world, but there is something very anthropocentric about that. It's like, Yes, we are, but we are not the only one. Mm. So we can be guilty or we can be responsible, but uh, uh, how can we change also that relation that now it's not 
about us moving the earth or changing the climate only is that we are dealing with others and how can we deal differently, but not through um, uh, being uh, creating a very moralistic relation with the with the with the with the environment, because then again it seems that we have the power. Mm. Then it's about uh, so in, in that sense. Uh, for me, again, is is about. Uh, the relation with the spec with the spec is the spectator as uh, we, we wanted to work with this idea of the audience is also there changing the thing mm -hmm. um, but they are not but the piece is also changing the audience and the space is also changing your experience so you are there as a um, as a force but you are not the only one and how to, to, yeah, to know as well that humanity is, is just an anecdote in history. And we are a force, but we are a very tiny force in, in terms of history as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, I don't know, maybe I went very far. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's great. I mean, yeah, I guess, um, well, one of the questions I thought of before, you know, before meeting is, yeah, is around yeah, yeah, the Anthropocene and because, of course, most of the way that I'm, I'm thinking a little bit of, of yeah, um, news media and when we talk about nature, we talk about the environment and so we talk about Greta Thunberg, uh, you know, the goody, and then we talk about oil corporations, the baddie, and um, and you know, it is a kind. There is a sort of moralizing framework in the sense of doing good. Uh, this, it's good for the environment to recycle. It's good, you know. Um, and I guess, yeah, the framework of the Anthropocene. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's basically like uh, acknowledging the culpability of not all the human race, but you know, typically it's a white Western kind of capitalist, you know, it's actually quite a small percentage of the global population that is responsible for climate change and all this. Um, but so therefore now we have to fix it. And so we're still in charge. Mm -hmm. and we're in charge of fixing it. We're in charge of fixing the planet, you know. And so it's still kind of, it, it brings it back to us. It brings it back to, uh, yeah, kind of an amazing agency that mm -hmm. we supposedly that we supposedly have, yeah. So yeah, it's kind of tricky, but I, yeah. So I guess I'm curious then in the field of, um, and maybe this is like, so we can start thinking about wind, winding down, but um, I'm curious about what theater and performance and art can be and can do in an ecological age. And of, in the UK, typically that this means that it's theater or art about the environment. So there is some kind of message perhaps about doing good, you know, I'm simplifying a little bit, but there mm -hmm. are like, you know, plays about climate change and they might sort of show you the, give you a sense of the devastation, like as if we don't know, as if we haven't read the news, like, do you, you know, do you understand that in 10 years time, the waters will rise and, you know, cities will flood and, you know, so it's kind of very much sort of driving home a kind of, oh my God, it's it's real, you know, it's really happening. What can we do? What can I do? You know, it's, it's this, I mean, it's all very, it's fundamental questions, of course. Um, but in a sense, it's not really addressing the art form. It's not addressing the moment itself, the encounter. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of using theatre as, as, as a transparent medium to, to explore a subject. And I guess what you're doing uh, I mean, I've only seen like a video of a rehearsal of, of, the, of the work, but I, but I get the sense that what you're doing is actually proposing that this encounter in the theatre, in the, the moment of theatre itself, can be a moment of, yeah, of encounter, or as you said, of, of transformation, mm -hmm. of being affected and affecting. And, mm -hmm. there's some, and that seems to me just as important as other conversations, you know, about the environment. Like there's a kind of... Yeah, it's it's about it's it's about the body. It's about the mind. It's about how we approach things. It's about how we position ourselves towards a cloud of smoke and 
and what we're able to make of it. Um, I don't know, it seems to be like a kind of, a, the word that comes to mind is a school actually, like a, a sort of a way of being in a state where you're able to explore some of your own ideas and perhaps figure something else, uh, f figure out something else about how to relate. And that to me seems like a very different space than the play that is exploring environmental catastrophe. And I'm, so I'm, I guess I'm just curious about what your experience has been in this process in relation to uh, environmentalism, in, in relation to, yeah, the Anthropocene and how, how you position this project in that debate, if you like. We had uh, quite a lot of talk about that at the very beginning, like when we were writing and trying to sell in the piece in order to find uh, um, money to be able to do it. And it was very hard for us to, to find a good, uh, a good way of, of, of explaining uh, what, what was our position on till where we have to explain our position. And I think uh, both of us, we are, um, uh, I would say, or I, I feel like this, Maria, you will say after, but I feel like uh, I'm very political, but not in only in the words, but more like in the form, uh, it's like, there is the form and the content, and for me, it cannot work uh, uh, without the other. Like it's not one or the other; it has to be uh, both. And I, I trust uh, in this kind of uh, political that you feel things like it's more related with something that is less than in the thinking, than, than uh, in the feeling or in the sensorial or in the. Yeah, to, to try to think together, not to give answers about something or to try to guide uh, people, but to try to create um, a context where we are uh, asking together, not alone, but together about, about what we are talking about, uh, about anthropocene, about ecology, about environment, uh, I mean, more large, like about the relation we have with, uh, with nature and how we feel like nature, like um, trying also to escape this binary uh, um, definition of the world, like uh, artificial, uh, natural, uh, outside, inside, uh, we and the other, uh, like trying to, <laughs> to erase this, this binary way of, of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I agree, and I, and I think um, I think we we our invitation to the audience is to experience the problem, not to give uh, like a position like a position, because I have the feeling that again, if we if we would do so, we keep on uh, maintaining certain structures of power that is actually. The other way around, what we want to experience is like uh, in this idea of giving agency to others, it's not about my message, it's about the problem. And how can we experience the problem in order to, to yeah, as, as, as you said, to, to, to feel this uncertainty, to, uh, to, to, to see what do we do with that uh, relations, with that timing that is probably not so accurate. So all, all these experiences for us is what, what brings the problem through the form of the piece, let's say. And um, yeah, I think that that is, uh, for example, I think about the climate change uh, and, and there is this idea of, while we are trying to understand and to have a position about climate change, the, 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 the climate has already changed. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, so uh, for me, this is more how can we experience the climate change more than how can we give the answer to the climate change because it is already changing. 
So our it seems that our answer is always behind. So yeah. 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 It was very nice this uh, af after playing the piece in uh, in um, Kai Theater in Brussels. Um, there were people that has not uh, a lot of relation with art or culture that were there in the in the room um, experiencing the the performance. And one of these guys that was helping us to bell a bell. <laughs> Ring a bell. Yeah, ring a bell uh, among the audience. Uh, the day after, he sent me um, um, a video of the sunrise at six in the morning. Then the, I think it was the first time he was looking at the sunrise. Mm -hmm. um, he has spent five minutes with the phone recording this sun going, um, going in. <laughs> and I, I was very really touched because it's like, okay, for, for him, the sun would not never be uh, the same as before he saw the, the performance. Mm -hmm. The sun will be a, like a personage for, for always. <laughs> he, he has created a relationship with this uh, bee. <laughs> Him. Yeah. yeah, we've been carrying uh, like there is something interesting for us in the in the process is uh, after the piece that we did in B Festival last year um, uh, uh, for online, uh, Edurne and me we were keep trying to keep on the practice of 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 the project alive through other media because we couldn't uh, meet uh, at that moment. So we created a chat, maybe I can share it here. Um, yeah, we created this, sh this chat that is uh, only skies. So we, I mean, our uh, purpose was it didn't happen all the time because that I would send a picture and Edurne would answer immediately with the sky that mm -hmm. she she's watching at that moment. So this is four uh, past four and this is ten past four. So it, it's more like seeing what are you what are you watching? And, and again, I, uh, sorry, and again accepting the failure because maybe Maria has a super beautiful sky and I have to do a photo of uh, what it was. It's supposed Indeed. to be a, a not beautiful sky. Finally, always is beautiful. Always you find something beautiful, but it's also this idea of, okay, this is what we have at that moment. And Yeah, and, and talking at what you say about the extra and also for us, this experience of this chat is also what do we pay attention to? Because normally when we chat and we send these kind of pictures is about, uh, I don't know, you in, you in wherever, you eating whatever, <laughs> you with somebody. Yeah. But uh, how, how can you bring the attention somewhere else? And this is already creating a relational rhizoma with something else that is not only the human quotidian life, but uh, well, this is something, for example, that uh, has changed us, I think, during the process, which is uh, how, what do we pay attention to in our daily life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm always quite amazed actually at how transformative these kinds of activities can be, like it, it seems to always happen by accident for me, but like I sort of remember that are like, oh yeah, the sun, the sun is rising, or there's, you know, it's it's a day. Why is it a day? Oh yeah, because the sun is in the sky. And it's something that we think, oh, this, you know, it's it's for children. It's like, sure, we have to teach the children so they know, they kind of they can assimilate that fact as a as as knowledge. But actually, um, that's not enough. Like, yeah, we absolutely need to be able to kind of integrate all of that. Um, I guess it's like pagan. <laughs> it's like a sort of, you know, a kind of, yeah, a relationship to earth, a relationship to the, to the elements. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be that we kind of, yeah, you know, suddenly start doing 
um, you know, arcane rituals. I think it can be anything. It can be just, yeah, sending, sending WhatsApp pics of, of the sky. That's like, that's absolutely enough. And it totally does, yeah, it changes your day, doesn't it? As soon as you're able to do that. Yeah. Mm. Well, should we keep on talking? <laughs> I think maybe because I think is the it, what we are proposing at the Bee Festival has a lot to do with that. How to gather together to do, to to see something that we that it happens every day. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we can leave it here. So then on the 10th and the 11th, the audience in, in the festival can experience a little bit of our conversation. Fantastic, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you. Good to meet you. Yeah, yeah, and good to meet you at a distance. And yeah, I hope we keep chatting more. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. We will do it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I guess we do, like, we say goodbye. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for the people who's listening <laughs> to us. <laughs>